In the last lecture, we studied the different metrics we use to describe the boundary layer. The 99% thickness, the displacement thickness, and the momentum thickness. Also, the ratio between displacement and the momentum thicknesses, that's the shape factor of the boundary layer. We also looked at how the pressure force affects the boundary layer by going through a simple exercise. The exercise splits the boundary layer into multiple uh, layers, in this case three layers, and analyze how an uh, adverse and a favorable pressure gradient affects the shape of the boundary layer. So today we have a more precise tool to do that. We have a Python code that goes through exactly the same procedure, except for instead of three layers, we have a hundred layers. So this is the code we are using right now. So as you can see, we started with a very thin boundary layer, just a, a one point. But as we evolve, so I'm going to share the code a bit later uh, to the class. So if we evolve for a little bit, the first uh, argument specifies how much we let the boundary layer evolve in terms of uh, uh, the viscosity times the x extent. We see that uh, the boundary layer forms a characteristic shape. So that this is what's known as the Blasius boundary layer. So the Blasius boundary layer looks almost like a straight line, but uh, curves a little bit as the velocity approaches the uh, velocity outside the boundary layer. So we can see that the 99% thickness is 1.6. So basically, if you draw a vertical line, uh, that's 99% of the free stream. And whenever you hit the boundary layer, that's maybe over here, that's where uh, the 99% thickness is. The delta star, the uh, momentum, sorry, delta star is the displacement thickness. It's like you take the area below this uh, black line and uh, figure out its area. So the equivalent rectangle, right, whose height is the delta star and width is the width from zero to the uh, velocity outside, would have the same area as the area underneath the um, boundary layer profile. So that's delta star. So delta star relates to the mass flux defect of the boundary layer. And uh, uh, theta, which is the momentum thickness, is related to the momentum defect of the boundary layer. So how much less momentum flux is in the boundary layer compared to without a boundary layer of the same mass flux. So the shape factor H is the ratio between delta star and theta. And for Blasius boundary layer, the boundary layer without any pressure effect, the H factor, the shape factor, is always 2.6. All right. So if we evolve a little bit further, we can see that uh, the boundary layer thickens due to viscous forces, but uh, uh, the shape factor stays the same. It's going to be a uh, 2.6 something. All right. So now let's look at the effect of pressure. So if we evolve uh, just uh, for a little bit, so less distance, but with a favorable pressure gradient, that means the uh, pressure is going to be decreased. So we can see that the shape factor decreased, right? The boundary layer becomes thinner, and uh, uh, the curvature of the boundary layer becomes even more negative. On the other hand, if we put a favorable pressure gradient, so we can see that uh, the shear factor becomes uh, increased and the boundary layer thickens pretty fast. So if we let the uh, adverse pressure gradient evolve a little bit more, you can see that uh, a positive curvature starts to form near the wall. So this is a characteristic of boundary layer on the adverse pressure gradient. So this reflex shape becomes more and more significant. And at some point, uh, the boundary layer is going to separate, right? So here the boundary layer separated uh, because the velocity near the wall now becomes negative. And here the shape factor increased uh, all the way from 4 to 6 and uh, pretty much to infinity when the flow separates. So this is the effect of the uh, pressure gradient. Uh, 
And uh, one of the things that uh, we want to take note is that what is the effect of viscous forces? So again, we form a Blasius boundary layer, and uh, instead of uh, uh, instead of uh, having the adverse pressure gradient to be 0.02 for every 0.1 of mu x, we make the pressure gradient uh, less. Actually, let's make the pressure gradient the same, but uh, with more viscous effects. We're going to see that uh, the addition of viscous force is going to really prevent the boundary layer from well, it didn't really prevent the boundary layer from separating in this case, but uh, uh, let's see, if we if we make even more viscous forces as the flow is subject to the same adverse pressure gradient the boundary layer becomes thicker, but uh, it is going to be a lot more resistant to flow separation. Actually, at this point, for example, if you stop the adverse pressure gradient and apply viscous forces, the boundary layer actually becomes fuller, right? It is uh, actually moving away from flow separation. And if you apply the adverse pressure gradient again, it goes back to about to separate again. So viscous forces help prevent flow separation. All right, now let's correlate what we learned about the effect of pressure forces to the shape of the airfoil. From the thin airfoil theory, we know that whenever we have an airfoil and increase the angle of attack, the pressure on the upper and lower surface of the, of the airfoil changes in a very particular pattern. The delta P due to a delta alpha follows a very distinct pattern. The pattern basically, the pressure difference due to a change of angle of attack peaks near the leading edge and it decreases slowly towards the trailing edge. Right, so that is the gap between the adjacent solid lines. Okay, and uh, this gap actually uh, for thin airfoils doesn't depend on the shape of the airfoil, but we remember that uh, for the thin airfoil theory, the delta P due to a change in alpha actually peaks to infinity at the leading edge. Of course, a realistic airfoil cannot have pressure that goes to minus infinity, right? So there is a finite peak for the difference in the pressure between adjacent angles of attack. And the height of the peak and its location actually depends on the leading edge radius of curvature. For a very shaped leading edge, the pressure spikes higher and happens closer to the leading edge. While for a thicker leading edge of higher radius of curvature, if you look at this gap between adjacent angles of attack, we see that the spike happens a lot more downstream and of much less magnitude. When you further move downstream, the curve still follows qualitatively what is predicted by the thin airfoil theory. But the spike actually depends on the leading edge radius of curvature. Okay, we can also see that uh, the CP curve also is determined by the shape of the airfoil at a zero degrees angle of attack. Now, how do these pressure uh, depend on how do the pressure change how the flow would separate. Particularly, let's look at whether the pressure forms favorable or adverse pressure gradient. So going back to the thin air flow, if we focus on the zero angle of attack curve, we can see that the pressure decreases from the stagnation pressure coefficient of 1 to the minimum value near the leading edge. So that's always the case for a uh, flow around a stagnation point, right? We have a pressure decreasing and therefore a favorable pressure gradient. At the stagnation point, we always have a CP of 1 and uh, CP cannot increase beyond 1. So we always know that when the flow diverges to both sides of the airfoil from the stagnation point, the pressure would drop as the streamlines move downstream, right? So that's 
favorable pressure gradient. Now, at the minimum pressure, uh, uh, the streamlines move, the boundary layer moves further downstream, the pressure would start to recover, right? The pressure would increase as we move downstream. And that is going to be adverse pressure gradient. Now, this pattern, as you increase the angle of attack, uh, we first look at the bottom side, the pressure side. The pressure side corresponds to the lower curves, and the lower curves has a higher minimum pressure. So that means both the favorable and adverse pressure gradients actually are less severe on the pressure side. Another way to say it is that the pressure side would look more like a flat plate, right? So that's actually uh, why the pressure side of wings are usually less interesting. I mean, flow separation would be less likely to occur on the pressure side, right? When the airplane is generating positive lift, the lower side of the wing is quite unlikely to separate. And uh, this is why when you look at an airplane wing, right, you see all kinds of stuff mounted underneath the wing but not above the wing so for example jet engines are mounted below the wing right and if look at pitot tubes and uh, other stuff they are usually mounted beneath the wing and uh, the upper side of the wing the suction side is going to be kept as clean as possible why if you look at the pressure on the upper side of the wing when it is generating positive lift you see because of the positive lift, you have a very small minimum pressure. And that small minimum pressure makes both the favorable and adverse pressure gradient on the top of the wing to be much more significant. And the adverse pressure gradient would more likely to cause flow separation. Right? Okay, and exactly how much the adverse pressure gradient is depend on how sharp the leading edge is. So for example, this airfoil is thin and has a sharp leading edge. And as a result, the spike, right, due to a, an angle of attack change, is very sharp near the leading edge. So the subsequent adverse pressure gradient can be very high when you put the airfoil at high angle of attack. Well, if you look, look at this airfoil, because of the thick leading edge, the high radius of curvature, the spike near the leading edge is not that significant, right? The spike is wide and its height is less. As a result of that, the adverse pressure gradient is less severe and happens more downstream. Okay, so let's use that knowledge to figure out how a wing is going to stop. So for example, if you look at a very thin airfoil, even if you only look at the uh, pressure distribution at zero angle of attack, you know that uh, uh, as you increase the angle of attack, there is going to be a spike in CP formed near the leading edge. And as you increase further the angle of attack, the spike is going to be, become higher and the spikier. Right? So the adverse pressure gradient near the leading edge is going to become more and more severe, eventually leading to flow separation near the leading edge. So the flow separation near the leading edge is going to be pretty sudden. So if you launch X-Foil and uh, uh, Naka 666, and we put a, a Reynolds number of 1 million and enable viscous mode, so zero angle of attack is going to give you the same uh, pressure distribution we see on the nodes. If you increase it to 5 degrees, we see that a very strong peak has formed, right? So if you do CP min of uh, minus 5, that will make the uh, peak into view. And uh, further, if you increase the angle of attack from 5 degrees to 6 degrees, you're going to see uh, the flow. Okay, in this case, it uh, still converged. And uh, if you increase it... Uh, further to 6.5 degrees, it converged 7 degrees, well, the flow now separated, right? And the separation location is right at the leading edge.
So this kind of separation is very sudden. So you increase the angle of attack a little bit, the flow separation suddenly occurs, and uh, uh, you're going to see a large change in the moment and a sudden drop in the lift coefficient. For an airplane, you want to avoid this type of stop. If you look at the different airfoil, a thick airfoil with a very large camber, with the high point closer to the trailing edge rather than the leading edge, you're going to see a very different picture. Here, we are just plotting the pressure distribution at 0.3 lift coefficient. But we can predict how this airfoil stalls. Because the large leading edge radius of curvature, we know that as the angle of attack increases, the top side of the pressure distribution, the blue curve, right, uh, is going to become a little bit more spikier near the leading edge. But in this region, we have a favorable pressure gradient. So that spike is going to lead to the downstream part of the favorable pressure gradient to be less favorable, and eventually it might turn into an adverse pressure gradient. But that is going to be pretty mild. On the other hand, the trailing edge region already has a very adverse pressure gradient, and increasing the angle of attack is going to make it worse. So this airfoil is more likely to separate near the trailing edge. So if we simulate it, CL.3, we should get the same curve as we see before. In this case, we don't need the as a small CP mean. Right? Okay. So then as we increase the angle of attack from minus 4 to minus 2, right, we did see the blue part, the upper side of the airfoil, has a less favorable pressure gradient over here. Alpha 0 uh, further right, uh, lessen the adverse pressure, uh, lessen the favorable pressure gradient, but you can see the trailing edge already get uh, more and more adverse pressure gradient. And you can see incipient flow separation actually happening near the trailing edge. So alpha 2 here, uh, basically the, the region where the favorable pressure gradient is becomes pretty flat and uh, the adverse pressure gradient near the trailing edge causes now a visible flow separation. 4 degrees, right, the flow separation near the trailing edge further increases. 6 degrees, right, now you have a very significant uh, flat region in the pressure distribution. That's the separated region near the trailing edge. Alpha 8, you can see the separation region further widens. Alpha 10, right, and uh, the separation region further widens. So this kind of flow separation happens very gradually. And uh, uh, starting from the trailing edge, the separation region just uh, keeps increasing as you change the angle of attack, right? This is uh, a much less of a uh, sudden behavior, and it is the more desirable way to store your wind. All right, now, how does the viscous force affect the boundary layer? Particularly when the flow is close to separation, we see the green type of boundary layer profiles, right, where uh, the curvature is positive, the second derivative of u with respect to y is positive near the wall. The viscous force, if you look at uh, uh, a positive second derivative, it actually accelerates the flow as the flow goes downstream. So when you have adverse pressure gradient, right, the viscous force actually prevents flow separation if it is strong enough to overwhelm the adverse pressure gradient. But how strong is the viscous force? If you look at the scale of the viscous flow term, right, it is the second derivative with respect to y. When the boundary layer thickens, for example, if the boundary layer becomes twice as thick with the same profile, just to scale the y direction by a factor of 2, we can see that the viscous forces, the shear stress, which is proportional to the derivative of u with respect to y, becomes half as much as the thinner, the twice thinner boundary layer. Also, the same difference, I mean, the actually half as much uh, 
difference in the shear stress has to drive twice as much flow, right? Twice as much inertia, twice as much uh, mass of flow. So the resulting acceleration due to viscous force is going to be four times less. The viscous force is actually proportional to one over the square of the boundary layer thickness for the same shape in the boundary layer profile. And that's true for laminar boundary layers. But uh, both for laminar and turbulent boundary layers, as the boundary layer thickens, the effect of viscous forces decreases. And thereby, therefore, a thicker boundary layer right, is less resistant to the same pressure gradient. Now that begs the question, if you want to design a high lift airfoil where the flow wouldn't separate, right, so let's say this point is the minimum pressure point, and do you know that the pressure has to increase back towards the trailing edge? Would you prefer a straight increase where the pressure gradient is kept the same adverse pressure gradient, or would you prefer a curvature like this, right, number two, or would you like a curvature like this, number three, right? Which one is least likely to separate and achieve the highest lift? Well, number one option has the constant adverse pressure gradient. Number two option has the pressure gradient, has the adverse pressure gradient becoming more severe as the flow goes downstream. This is at the same time when the boundary layer becomes thicker, right, due to a combination of viscous forces and adverse pressure gradient. So the flow would more likely to separate near the trailing edge. Well, option three is a better design because initially when the boundary layer is still thin, we have a higher adverse pressure gradient. A thinner boundary layer has more viscous forces and therefore is more resistant to a higher adverse pressure gradient. While you move more downstream, the boundary layer thickens, and you also alleviate the adverse pressure gradient by curving the pressure curve to be more flat. Right? So this way, you have the best hope of preventing flow separation over the entire suction side of the airfoil. All right, so uh, this is for laminar this is for laminar boundary layers and turbulent boundary layers has its own feature so let's watch a video of what a turbulent boundary layer looks like so here you have flow transition from a laminar boundary layer and a turbulent boundary layer you can see the turbulent boundary layer has a lot of mixing, right? The flow goes, some pockets of the flow goes from outside of the boundary layer into the boundary layer, while other pockets of flow goes from inside the boundary layer, migrating to the outside of the boundary layer. So this turbulence actually provides an effect very analogous to additional viscosity or additional viscous forces. Basically, uh, it has the same equalizing effect as viscous forces, right? A viscous force tries to drag any slower moving flow, right? If it is right next to a faster moving flow, it drags the slow moving flow to go faster. And the slower moving flow drags the faster moving flow to make it slower. So viscous force is an equalizing effect. That is why it is proportional to the derivative of velocity. Turbulence is another equalizing mechanism. This is because a po some pockets of the flow in the faster moving stream, right? It doesn't just drag the slower moving stream. It actually, part of it actually moves into the slower moving stream, right? So that on average makes the slower moving stream faster. While some part of the slower moving stream moves into the faster moving stream. Right, that also slows down, on average, the faster moving stream and then make it slower. So this is in addition to the viscous forces, in addition to the, uh, to the just the dragging of the flow. You have like actually mobility between the different streams. So in this re respect, a turbulent boundary layer is like a laminar boundary layer, but with a lot higher viscosity, 
And what we did, did we say about the, how the viscous force is, is going to help, it's going to uh, make separation more or less likely, right? We saw that when the boundary layer is in a reflex shape, viscous forces actually brings the flow of fluid to faster and prevents flow separation. And that effect is even higher, is even more strong in a turbulent boundary layer, making a turbulent boundary layer much less likely to separate under the same pressure gradient. One of the result of a turbulent boundary layer made much less likely to separate is the drag crisis. So this is a typical plot of how the drag coefficient on the circular cylinder changes as a function of the Reynolds number, which is defined as velocity times the diameter of the cylinder times air density and divided by viscosity. So at low Reynolds numbers, you see that the drag drops as the Reynolds number increases. And that is because as the Reynolds number increases, we have less and less skin friction drag. Right, because effectively, the viscosity would decrease. But there is a certain flat region where the drag coefficient does not depend much on Reynolds number. So this is because in this region, the drag is dominated not by skin friction, but by flow separation. If you look at a cylinder like this, the pressure coefficient upstream is equal to 1, right? That's the stagnation point. It becomes smaller and smaller as the flow accelerates. But as the flow separates over here, that's a boundary layer separation point, the pressure after the separation point is more or less flat. As a result, there is a pressure difference between the uh, upstream facing side of the cylinder and the downstream facing side of the cylinder. And that pressure difference drives majority of the drag in this region. So how would the drag suddenly decrease as you further increase the Reynolds number? Well, that's the effect of turbulent boundary layer, more resistant to flow separation. This sudden drop in drag coefficient happens when the boundary layer before the separation transitions from laminar to turbulent boundary layer. Right? And this is why this transition point uh, differs for smooth versus rough surfaces. For rough surface, uh, the roughness helps transition, so the transition to turbulence happens at smaller Reynolds numbers. So as the flow transitions, the boundary layer is more resistant to flow separation, and as a result, the separation suddenly moves more downstream. There is a less separated region, and as a result, there is a less pressure difference between the upstream and downstream portions of the cylinder. As a result, the drag decreases a lot. Okay, so this is uh, one of the applications of the turbulent boundary layer more resistant to flow separation. Another application is a typical high lift airfoil design. So, for example, this airfoil is designed to be very high lift, right? It's used in some of the wind turbine applications. And if you look at the pressure signature on the upper side of the airfoil, it follows two very distinct curves. Each curve is designed in a way that the adverse pressure gradient becomes less and less as you move downstream. That makes sense, right? Because as we move more downstream, the boundary layer thickens, and we know a thicker boundary layer is less resistant to flow separation because it has less viscous forces. So therefore, you want to have a less severe adverse pressure gradient as you move downstream, right? So this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the principle we learned earlier of the effect of viscous forces resisting flow separation more upstream, you have very thin boundary layer. You are more resistant to very high adverse pressure gradient. As you move downstream, you are less resistant, so you want to alleviate the adverse pressure gradient. But why is there a kink over here? Why does the adverse pressure gradient become steeper, become more severe after this point? Right? I mean, after this point, you also see a distinctive pattern where 
uh, the adverse pressure gradient becomes slightly less as you move downstream, right? But here, around this point, you have, have a sudden increase in the adverse pressure gradient. Why? Well, this is because for the particular renal number for which the airfoil is designed to operate, the designer has confidence that by this point, the boundary layer has transitioned from laminar to turbulence. And the turbulent boundary layer, even for the same thickness, is a lot more resistant to adverse pressure gradient. Therefore, it is okay to starting from this point to apply a more adverse pressure gradient. Right? So this is basically taking into consideration of the transition from laminar to turbulent boundary layer. Of course, even in a turbulent boundary layer, as the boundary layer becomes thicker and thicker, there are also less and less viscous forces. Although the scaling of viscous force of the uh, of the kind of equalizing force due to turbulence does not go like one over delta square, right? The the trend is much less uh, acute as the boundary layer thickens. The viscous forces, the turbulent uh, viscous forces, decreases a little bit, but not as much as one over delta squared. So you also see this curve becoming more and more gentle, but uh, the trend uh, is not as uh, significant as in the laminar portion of the uh, airfoil. All right, this is uh, uh, this is actually one of the reasons why you don't see any universal high lift airfoils. Right, there is no universal high lift airfoil that works for all possible Reynolds numbers. You have to take into consideration of where the flow would transition, right? How much viscous forces you get uh, at different renal numbers that uh, basically determine different high lift airflow designs at different speeds and renal numbers. Finally, we want to look at uh, one of the most uh, widely used ways to prevent flow separation. That's basically having gaps, right, uh, between portions of the airfoil introduced by slats and flaps. So the slat is used to prevent flow separation near the trailing edge, while flaps are used to prevent flow separation near the near the trailing edge. Sorry, slats prevent flow separation near the leading edge. So the effect is that when the flow is close to separate at the end of the slat region, the flow from the gap actually provides a higher energy right flow that just goes in the region where the speed is very slow. So this higher energy, faster flow, actually brings re-energizes the boundary layer, brings the slower velocity now to faster speed, and that prevents flow separation. This works both near the leading edge and the trailing edge. Right, so when you have adverse pressure gradient, the velocity near the wall becomes small. You have a gap that injects higher velocity flow. That is a very good way to prevent flow separation. If you look at the Formula One cars, you have a multi-element airfoil, right? Uh, more than just a, a main airfoil, a slat and a flap. There are a lot of gaps within uh, this this wing. These basically provides very very high lift with the constrained space all right this concludes our discussion of boundary layers and the viscous flows and the next week we are going to discuss transonic and supersonic flows